I was looking back at this thing that I really love. I wanted to share this with you because I haven't done this on other interviews, but um, this became a disease problem that was being discussed in medicine in the early 1800s. And by 1840, it had its own diagnosis, the dietary poisoning by oxalates. And, um, and this, this is an article from 1846, a guy named Wilson, and he talks about what they see in the patients with oxalate. And I think it's really fun. So she <laughs> a sense of the emphasis is on neurotoxicity that's affecting people's personalities and moods. And it was really obvious to these guys because they knew them. They were like fellow elites. They were the young doctors and so on who were getting into trouble with rhubarb and like, you know, they could go to the little bakery and get rhubarb tarts during rhubarb season, which started at Christmas time because they would force rhubarb. It was this huge fad, like spinach smoothies are now. The rich people who could afford sugar were eating these rhubarb tarts and rhubarb this and pastries and whatever. And so they they would know these guys who would suddenly become like negative, irritable, weird <laughs> their personalities would change. So this description talks about the symptoms of oxalate poisoning, and it starts off saying that cases are characterized by depression with great irritability, the more prominent symptoms of which are lowness of spirits. I love this one. Apprehension of impending evil. Okay, this E or brain, right? Everything in the future is going to be horrible. Irritability of temper, emaciation, fatigue from slight exertion, diminished sexual power, pain, a sense of weight across the loins. Okay, this is pelvic heaviness um, and gastric derangements. And then it goes on and says, we often see oxalate crystals in the urine of cases of infection like tuberculosis and arthritis in soft bones or osteomalacia and with skin boils. And they go on and talk about the various skin things and the connection with oxalate in the urine. So interestingly, that pretty covers it. We have the neurotoxicity affecting mood and personality and ability to think, energy levels collapsing. You see uh, um, digestive problems, connective tissue problems with arthritis and so on, and the skin, skin boils, and then the bones is another connective tissue thing. So you see this kind of triad, plus they're saying loins, heaviness in the loins, that's inflammation happening down there in the bladder region and the, it, even the genital region. And so you see the urinary tract affected, the digestive tract affected, the nervous system affected, the connective tissues like the bones and the skin, and you see the immune system affected with this connection with infection. Wow. So it's far-reaching. It basically affects, can affect anything. Pretty much. Okay. So the next logical question is somebody tuning in here and, you know, most people from time to time at least have, you know, some of the different challenges you mentioned there. How do they begin to know if oxalates is at the root of that? Is there some kind of testing we can have done to see our oxalate levels? Or how do we go about assessing whether or not that's at the root of, of the health challenge? If there were um, easy, inexpensive, objective measures like blood tests, we would already know about this problem. We would be able to document it and, and it wouldn't be such an unusual topic. But that's one reason why we don't know about it, is it's hard to test for. The gold standard test in medicine is to take a chip of bone out of your hip and see if you have oxalate accumulating in your bones. And even that is prone to something we call false negatives, where you might miss sample and get a spot where there's not the oxalates. Maybe all your oxalates are in your neck and not your hip, you know, and you can miss it. Um, and that's not going to happen anyway. No one's going to take out a chip of bone from your hip so you're safe. <laughs> Because you have to be a pretty severe case where they're suspecting the genetic form of this condition because there is a genetic form called primary hyperoxaluria where that internal production in liver is off the charts because of um, damage to the way where the enzymes are in the cells and so on and enzymes that are broken. You can't make them properly and so on. There's, there's all these different forms of mutations that has this effect of now the liver and cells are producing way too much oxalate. So um, I'm losing track of my, <laughs> but the no, we're we're just trying to get to the bottom of somebody who is is suffering with one of the symptoms yeah. that you mentioned there, or I'm sure that's just a sample. There's like, probably others as well. How do we begin to uncover whether oxalates is part of our health challenge? 
I have c created what they do in toxicology, which is look at exposure levels and look at symptom patterns. So on my website and in the book, there's a self-assessment where you can look at your history of using high oxalate foods. You can look at your patterns of symptoms and you can think about your risk factors because the the degree, the quickness at which to which oxalates may affect your health and show up as symptoms could be a product of how well your gut is is or is not able to handle controlling the absorption rate, how much can gets in your bloodstream, and how well your kidneys are excreting them. So if you've been on a lot of NSAIDs or antibiotics, that's going to harm your kidneys and your gut and your liver to the extent that it could affect your susceptibility, like you may be, become a hyperabsorber of oxalate. And hyperabsorber means a lot more gets from your food into your blood than should, and that can be four or five times the expected normal absorption rate. And that means you don't even need a high oxalate diet. So if you look at your risk factors, if you've had a history of a lot of NSAIDs or irritable bowel or celiac or any kind of digestive disorder, of which oxalate can play a major role in the development and severity of those problems, that in itself is something to be concerned about. A history of bariatric surgery creates a malabsorptive condition where you don't absorb nutrients well, but you absorb toxins more easily. So it damages all that whole protective system. So if you've had bariatric surgery, you should absolutely be on a low oxalate diet from the get-go, from before you had your surgery. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of patients don't know about that. So look at risks like history of drug use, but your your gastric well-being and your kidney function matter a lot. If you've had a history of eating these foods, over time that's inevitably going to cause trouble. And then if you see this pattern of symptoms showing up that affect one of these systems, if you have bad sleep and so on, then there's a connection for people. The thing is, you don't necessarily do this with other toxins. You don't say, well, I'll wait to see if I'm vulnerable to mercury before I question whether I should put mercury fillings in my mouth. Um, but people want to do this with oxalate because it's in foods we trust and we don't want to change our paradigm about what's okay to eat. And we don't want to break our love affair with the concept that these foods that are high in oxalate are sweet and benign and love us and are great for us in any quantity. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. People are literally buying these massive clamshell boxes of spinach and using half pound or more of spinach every day. That is really toxic. I was looking back at this thing that I really love. I wanted to share this with you.